Okay, I'll try and go for this one a bit quicker then, folks, because I realised the last video ended up being quite long. Uh, so, a voltaic cell is constructed from zinc and copper half cells. Zinc is more reactive than copper, which statement is correct when the cell produces electricity. So, okay, there we've got the zinc half cell, the copper half cell. Electrons flow from the copper half cell to the zinc half cell. Well, that's incorrect. They flow from the more reactive metal. So, the electrons will be flowing from the zinc half cell to the copper half cell. Uh, and then what's happening there is your zinc rod will be releasing electrons by forming zinc 2 plus ions. And then the electrons will be accepted at the copper electrode by the copper 2 plus ions. Gaining electrons and then depositing this copper on the surface. So then the concentration of copper 2 plus increases. Uh, well, no, it's going to decrease because the copper 2 plus ions are gaining those electrons and becoming copper atoms. So it's going to decrease. Electrons flow through the salt bridge. Uh, no, they just flow through the external circuit, through the wires. Uh, they can't flow through the piece of filter paper or whatever it is. Uh, so because often this is like a sort of a piece of saturated potassium nitrate solution on filter paper. Uh, so that's wrong. So hopefully it must be this last one. Negative ions flow through the salt bridge from the copper half cell to the zinc half cell. Well, we do need negative ions to flow into this cell. And the reason for that is otherwise it'll stop working. Because at the start, the balances were charged between the zinc 2 plus ions and whatever other ions were present, chloride ions or whatever. But as we're creating more positive ions, there will be a buildup of positive charge in this cell because there'll be more positive ions than there are negative ions. We need negative ions to flow into the cell as well to balance out that charge. Similarly, in this one, we would need positive ions to flow into this cell because the concentration of positive ions is decreasing, so there'd be less positive ions than negative ions, so that's why we need positive ions to go in and balance the charge, otherwise uh, the cell will stop working. So D is the right answer. The next one, which signs for both E cell and delta G result in a spontaneous redox reaction occurring under standard conditions? Uh, so you just need to know these. So E cell, you need to know that it's positive when it's feasible, and delta G, you need to know that it's negative uh, for when it's feasible. So remember, this one is where you have the standard electrode potentials and you add them together, uh, see if they're positive. And then this one, of course, we need a, a negative value from delta H minus T delta S. That's why exothermic reactions tend to be spontaneous because you've got a good head start because delta H is negative. But yeah, you should. You really just want to make sure you know those. Uh, so E cell positive, E cell positive, delta G negative. So D is the right answer. 33 then. Uh, so an iron rod is electrolyte of silver, which is a correct condition for this process. Uh, so silver electrode is positive rod, iron rod is positive electrode. So already I'm kind of, that's quite a good clue here in that if you think it must be one of these two, because if that one's wrong, that one must be right and vice versa. So hopefully I won't need these other two. Let's just have a we'll have a think about the process. So if I've got two rods and going to connect them up in a circuit. I haven't decided on the battery yet which way I'm going to put the polarity. And of course I'm using there. So let's make this one the iron one and let's make this one the silver one. And I'm going to plate the iron one with silver which means what I need is for silver ions to come on here uh, by gaining electrons and turning into silver atoms. Now if this is going to attract positive ions, this must be the negative electrode because opposites attract. So this would be the little short one, this would be the big long one. Just like the way around this. And that means this will be the positive one. Uh, yeah, so that's a justification for that. So your positive metal ions will be attracted to the negative electrode. Uh, so the iron one can't be the positive one. So the iron one is the negative one. If the iron one is the negative one, the silver one must be the positive one. Okay, because basically you then got in, uh, you'd have other things coming to here then, I suppose, like sort of whatever else is in solution would be discharging at this electrode. Uh, the electrolyte is iron sulfate. Well, no, you'd want silver nitrate. If you're plating with um, silver, you want silver ions in solution already, and then this is just to replenish them. So, and there's not many soluble silver substances. Silver nitrate is one of them, so that's wrong. You'd need silver nitrate. And then oxidation occurs at the negative electrode. Um, 
Well, what have we got going on here? This is the negative electrode. Uh, we've got the silver ions again in electrons, so we've actually got reduction going on uh, at the negative electrode in this case. Uh, reduction always occurs at the cathode. You can remember that as from red cat or uh, the middle letter being a C, so that is um, cathode. So, yeah, we've got reduction occurring, so this one therefore must be the uh, cathode, and uh, we've got the anode here then. Not that we actually need to worry about that. That makes sense because this is an electrolytic cell. It's not actually a battery or a voltaic cell. Because remember, in electrolytic cells, uh, which we then use for electroplating as well, you can use the acronym PANIC. Positive is anode, negative is cathode. Because uh, they say there's a battery here, not a voltmeter. Uh, in, volt, in voltaic cells, they're the other way around, uh, the polarities. However, you always get reduction of the C, middle letter C at the cathode, oxidation of the anode. Okay, 34 then, uh, into the final straight now, organic chemistry, structure of a drug used to treat symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is shown below, which functional groups are present in this molecule, uh, we've got uh, two ethers, uh, we've got a hydroxyl group, we've got an alkene and we've got an amine, we've also got a phenyl ring, so hydroxyl and ester, well, we've got a hydroxyl but we don't have an ester, hydroxide and ether, uh, well hydroxide doesn't sound too bad but hydroxide remember is OH minus, uh, so I don't want to be going with that, hydroxyl and ether, that looks good, Hydroxide and ester, no. So again, they're trying to catch you out there. Hydroxyl is the, the technical name for the, the alcohol functional group, not hydroxide, which is actually the ion, OH minus. 35, which monomer is used to form the polymer with the following repeat unit? So this is comes from an addition polymer. Uh, the easy way to kind of then sort of think what we come from is just draw it out identically, but kind of going backwards. So basically where you've got a double bond and you've got rid of the continuation bonds, Uh, could kind of draw like that as well as what then. So looking at matching up these ones, uh, this one's looking pretty good because A, that looks like a match. B, uh, the double bond is in the wrong place. So what we've got with, because yeah, what we've got here is this stuff. B, what we've got is one, two, and then the double bond. So that would be B1 in. Uh, here we don't even have a double bond. This is just butane. One, two, three. So it won't even uh, that won't even undergo addition polymerization. And then here we've got both carbons on the double bond. So A is going to be the right answer. That's the one we want. Uh, Thirty-six. Which is correct for the conversion of propanal to propyl methanoate? Uh, so we've got propanal. Uh, being reduced to an alcohol, uh, so step one and reagent one, and then we've got concentrated acid and methanoic acid, so then we've got an esterification for step two. So looking through these possibilities then, so reagent for step one, well, water's not going to act as a reducing agent, so that's wrong. Dichromate, well, that's a very powerful oxidizing agent. If anything, that would take it to a carboxylic acid, uh, so that's wrong. So sodium borohydride, sodium borohydride, and then reaction type in step one, uh, we're not adding water to it, it's not a hydration, we've eliminated that area, it's not an oxidation, it's a reduction because basically we're adding hydrogen to the um, aldehyde. So reduction, reduction. And then this next bit then, so the next one is an esterification. An esterification is not an oxidation. Uh, we could classify it more as a nucleophilic substitution or condensation where basically what we're substituting is the OH in the carboxylic acid for an alcohol and we could classify it as a condensation because we're taking two molecules and combining them together, condensing them into a larger molecule with the release of another small water, uh, molecule which would be water. So basically if I kind of did little skeletal structures up here perhaps we've got, uh, let's do the methanoic acid, so that would be this and then your Propanol, propanol is one, two, three. So your electrons are going to come in and attack uh, that carbon. That's going to get kicked out. And then we're going to end up with our ester uh, plus uh, water. Okay, so it's a condensation because you can two small molecules, combine them into a larger one with uh, the uh, elimination of a, a small molecule as well, which is water in this case. And we could say that we substituted the hydroxyl uh, of the carboxylic acid with uh, an, al an alcohol instead. Naming this one, that would then come from this would be prop 
Kyle. Oh, it knows it there. <laughs> Never know it. Uh, 37. Which statement is correct for a pair of enantiomers under the same conditions? A racemic mixture of the enantiomers is optically active. Well, a racemic mixture, you've got a 50-50, uh, so the effect would cancel out just as much as one rotates it anti-clockwise, the other would rotate it by the same one clockwise, so it would not be optically active. Uh, they have the same chemical properties in all their reactions. Uh, well, they do have very, they do behave very similarly, and that doesn't sound like a bad answer, but let's have a look at somebody else. They have the same melting and boiling point. Well, that is correct. It's very, very difficult to separate enantiomers because they have identical physical properties. So that's looking pretty good. Uh, they rotate the plane polarized light by different angles. Well, not if you get the same concentration of each of them. If you have the same concentration of one enantiomer and the same concentration of the other enantiomer, uh, then the same conditions and everything, then that's, that's not right. This one is not a terrible answer, but you do have to remember is that, remember thalidomide in that sort of, um, it was a drug which uh, the two enantiomers have very different effects on the human body. And that's because the body is full of chiral centers itself. So whilst they might undergo, if it was a simple reaction with uh, another achiral molecule, they might have identical chemical reactions there. If they were undergoing a chemical reaction with a, another molecule, which also had a chiral center, there would be a difference in their reactivity. It could be that one of them wouldn't react at all and one of them uh, would react. Um, so they don't have the same chemical properties in all their reactions. It can be very similar in many of them, near identical in many of them, but if you've got another reaction which involves another chiral center, then it could be quite different. So I'm gonna put cross on that one and go with C. Uh, 38. A student carried out a titration to determine the concentration of an acid and found that it valued good precision but poor accuracy, which process explains this outcome. So consistently overshooting the volume of solution from the burette into the flask, collection of insufficient titration data, reading the meniscus in the burette at a different angle each time, forgetting to rinse the flask after one of the titrations. Um, now, it's meaning what, what they mean about precision here, because you might sort of think, oh, precision, that's the precision of the burette in there, where it's plus or minus 0 0.05 centimetres cubed. But there's another way of defining precision, and the dartboard analogy is a good idea. In that, if you have a dartboard, and let's say the target is the bullseye, if you have four darts which hit right around it, they would have poor precision because they're far away from each other, and also poor accuracy because they're well away from the bullseye. So this would be poor precision and poor accuracy. Whereas another dartboard and the darts are clustered here would have good precision because they're very close together. The darts are very well grouped, but they're still well off the bullseye, the target. So poor accuracy. And then our other outcome, of course, is where the darts are right around the bullseye, which would be good precision. And also good accuracy. Okay, that's what you're talking about. So, reading the meniscus and the burette at a different angle each time, if they read it at the same angle each time, but it was wrong, then that would lead to good precision. But the fact they're reading it from a different angle each time is gonna ruin their precision. It might not be sort of massively extreme, but I'm not liking that one, because the fact that, what we're looking for, remember here, is that we've got a, a systematic error in that we've got poor accuracy, but we've actually got minimized kind of random errors in that, so like the results are sort of grouped pretty close together. Whereas here, if we're reading it from a different angle each time, that's gonna make the results quite random. Uh, forgetting to rinse the flask after one of the titrations. Well, if we forget to rinse it after one of the titrations, that could affect one of the experiments quite substantially. And one of the results is going to be quite different to some of the others then. So I'm not really liking this one. Uh, collection of insufficient titration data. Uh, well, it's maybe not looking too bad, but how could you argue then that you've got good precision if you don't have many darts, if you've only got a couple of darts because you've only sort of um, done... Uh, a few bits, then maybe you couldn't argue that you had good precision. So it's not a bad answer, but let's try and justify this one a bit more. Can we? So consistently overshooting the volume of solution from the burette into the flask. I think the key word there is consistent. So consistently overshooting the volume. Let's say so that they always had just an extra 0.1 centimeters cubed. 
uh, or 0.5 centimeters cubed to what they should, then their results are going to be very close together, but not actually accurate. But they're consistently overestimated, and so they're consistently away from uh, the the actual target. So I'm going to go with A, probably being the best answer there. And then last two, number 39, a bit of uh, spectroscopy now then. So what is always correct about the molecular ion M plus in a mass spectrum of a compound? The M plus ion peak has the smallest mass to charge ratio. Well, no, it should be the largest because uh, it's the whole molecule. Uh, the mass to charge ratio of the M plus ion peak gives the relative molecular mass of the molecule. That sounds good to me, but let's check the others. The M plus ion is the most stable fragment form during electron bombardment. Not necessarily. When you get your mass spec, remember, the MZ1 is going to be the one which is furthest to the right, but you might have all sorts of other fragments in there which actually have a higher abundance and are more stable, uh, so it's not that one. And then the M plus ion peak has the greatest intensity. Well, that would support this one because the taller they are, the, the more stable they are. Uh, so again, not this one. We're looking for B. And then number 40, which property explains why tetramethylsilane can be used as a reference standard in proton NMR spectroscopy? It has a high boiling point. No, it doesn't. It has a low boiling point, which is good because we can evaporate it away from our sample easily later. It is a reactive compound. No, it's not. It's a very unreactive compound, which is good. It doesn't react with the compound we want to uh, do the NMR of. All of its protons are in the same chemical environment. That is true because it's SiCH4 like that, and it's got perfect symmetry. So remember the nice thing about this is when we got our NMR spectrum down at the, in PPM or delta, whatever you call, call it, uh, down at naught you get a nice kind of sharp single peak uh, because all the protons are in the same chemical environment. It doesn't give multiple signals. So C is the right answer. Okay, hope you found that useful then folks. And that's the end of this video.